Okay, and so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dan Stow, who's currently an Associate Professor of AI and Bi Biodiversity, jointly appointed at Tilburg University and Naturalis Biodiversity Center. Um, since 2012, he's been working on computational bioacoustics using machine learning and signal processing. And he actually was a co-founder of the detection and classification of sound scenes and events known as the DCASE community, which has really kind of pioneered people working on audio that wasn't speech and music. And, you know, it's now grown up to a really uh, vibrant community. So we can thank Dan for that. And, um, and additionally, he's uh, an elected member of the International Bioacoustics Council, Executive Committee, and an Associate Editor at P PLOS Computational Biology and Peer G Computer Science. He also co-founded as in the CTO of Warbler, which is a phone app that recognizes bird sounds that I'm sure some of you maybe have used. And if you haven't, you should try it out. It's pretty cool. And um, so, yeah, he's going to tell us about all his his cool work on, you know, using AI to understand wildlife, which is really exciting. So thank you, Dan, for coming. And floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, really pleased to be invited to be talking to a group that's done so much uh, interesting work and uh, have for the opportunity to, to talk about uh, wildlife sounds to you. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yes, so I'm uh, Dan Stowell and I'm based at Tilburg University and Naturalis Biodiversity Centre. Um, as Gordon said in the introduction, I've been working on wildlife sounds for quite a long time. For the past couple of years, I've been based in the Netherlands where we're trying to make this work at a large scale. And so that's pretty much the main motivation for what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. To give you the general motivation, um, well, you may well know that uh, biodiversity loss is one of the big uh, issues of our time. Uh, even the World Economic Forum uh, noticed, as, uh, as you can see in this uh, chart. To spell it out, if you look at this red line, this is uh, the European farmland species, the populations of birds uh, since 1980. And you can see that the decline is actually staggering. If you've not seen these uh, graphs before, a decline of something like 50% in a population is, uh, right, that, that should be ringing alarm bells. That's uh, the index for Europe. Um, we have, it hits the headlines all the time. And of course, uh, the same is true for North America as well uh worldwide and for people who are interested in audio it's uh interestingly it's an opportunity because audio is one of the best mediums we have for monitoring birds insects whales many other species and because bioacoustic monitoring has also entered a big data era um, with lots of audio data being collected now the challenge is what can we do with that and so my uh context now is here i am in the netherlands and we are running large projects where we want to monitor all of the species in the Netherlands. So that's all of the multicellular species. And that's a pretty big challenge. Um, this is not my project. It's a large collaboration. But uh, uh, even for one country, this is a really big undertaking. Then um, beyond that, at the European level, we actually want to, to run these things as a service across Europe. So within these projects that I've uh, listed here, we are providing, we're creating an infrastructure for wildlife sound uh, recognition, among other things, to be run as a service um, across, uh, across Europe. And so the strands of this, it's actually not just audio. As you can see in this uh, illustration, we've got computer vision, acoustic monitoring, radar, and molecular methods, so DNA, barcoding, and, and related things. Because, of course, there are some species which you can analyze well through uh, uh, image detection, such as camera traps, some which you can uh, detect well from acoustic monitoring and so on. So, of course, we don't claim that acoustic monitoring will detect absolutely everything. But for, for a lot of species, it's a really important part of the picture. So let's uh, let's dive into a couple of sounds. I'm assuming that uh, you're all pretty familiar with audio and that you know what a spectrogram looks like. So we've got time on the X axis and frequency on the Y axis. Um, but we do want to think about nature sounds uh, in particular. So let me uh, let me start with some of these things. So I'm going to start with the top left and let's just uh, play that back.
Now, uh, I won't ask you to name every species that was in that recording, um, but that's basically a, a great example of the kind of challenge that we want to solve. Um, do you even know how many species were in that recording? It's kind of interesting to think. If we want to answer questions like that, even the number of species, as opposed to listing every single species, would be useful information if we could uh, if we could answer it. And so that was birdsong mostly. Uh, and in the top right hand corner, we have a different uh, category of sound. So an insect sound. Now, did that sound like a single animal or did it sound like multiple things going on? I think insect sounds are particularly interesting because they're quite different from a lot of the other sound producing uh, mechanisms that we're used to, such as the human sound producing apparatus. Um, and you can see that on this diagram. You may have been able to sort of pick it up, but you can also roughly see it on the spectrogram that I think there are actually two individuals um, both chirping in that in that sound recording. And these are great examples, but let's uh, let's take some less great examples. Down in the lower left, you can see. Well, okay, it's a little bit hard to see, but let's play the play the sound back. Uh, now this one's pretty extreme because, okay. Th there's some building work going on, and this is actually a project we're running to monitor biodiversity in a active construction site. And so this might seem like a, a bizarrely bad example, but uh, we have very loud construction noise. And we also, just before the construction noise, was a, a sort of electronic warning beep from the machine that was uh, active. And just a tiny bit of energy in the background that's actually the biodiversity that we want to analyze. We have some uh, some bird chirps in there just before before we call the machinery. And so for the final one, uh, another uh, classic example. Okay, this time the uh, individuals, the species in question was in fact humans. Um, there are a few reasons to include a, a recording like this in, in my examples. One is that, OK, we're going to get a lot of human uh, sounds on our, our recordings and we need to be able to deal with them in various ways. But another one is think of that as an analogy between the sounds of many individuals, which you can you can maybe approximate how many individuals are there. Um, and think of generalizing that to something like a, a flock of birds. How many individuals can we detect? Uh, well, can we estimate how many how many individuals in a sound scene? So I'm, I'm trying to uh, motivate sort of some of what's going on in the sort of question we want to analyze uh, in bioacoustic data sets and emphasize that they're not easy data sets. So we very often have many sounds at once. They're almost entirely unbalanced. We have some very, very common species and some very rare species. Now, of course, the rare species might be particularly interesting. So uh, so for the for the very low representation of these classes, we still want to be able to handle them appropriately. Many of the large data sets are unlabeled. Um, we have very noisy backgrounds, as I've illustrated, and time varying conditions. And yet we want, what we want to achieve is high precision, ideally high precision over all these different classes for useful estimates. So difficult data sets, great. Um, in the talk, I'm going to talk primarily about acoustic species recognition. Okay, so this is a specific uh, classification task that is, is pretty much the core task in, uh, in most bioacoustics. And what we want is to achieve reliable species detections at continental scale. So I'll start by telling you what this, roughly what the state of the art is. And then I'm going to talk about some of the directions we're working on to, uh, to achieve this sort of scale and reliability. Um, and I'm interested in sort of specifying the problem as much as uh, as much as the solutions. And I'd, I'd love to uh, I'd love to think through with you what what could be good uh, strategies for this type of work. And so yes, I'll talk about uh, various topics, 
often related to deep embeddings. And so we'll go through those as we, as we come to them. The state of the art, um, Shazam for birds. This is uh, a phrase which uh, we first saw in the news in 2014. Um, this was a news story about our app being launched. Um, and we tried to stop them using the phrase Shazam for birds because we were worried about trademark infringement, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that was the news story. Um, so do we have Shazam for birds? Well, that was 2014. Uh, here's 2015, um, 2017, uh, 2021, and uh, 2023. It seems we're going to have Shazam for birds perhaps uh, every year for, for, for now onwards. Um, now, you may well know that Shazam is an audio fingerprinting uh, application, which is a little bit different from uh, a, a general classification algorithm. So. Um, the analogy is actually a little bit of a stretch. I'm not going to talk about fingerprinting uh, in this talk, and I'm not going to talk about why fingerprinting is not the best method for uh, for wildlife sounds. This is uh, something we can talk about afterwards if, uh, if if you're interested. But instead, we'll we'll see how far we've got with the classification task. So, um, bird clef is the name of a uh, challenge which is run annually. Um, it's not my challenge, but it's a very good uh, benchmark in the field. And you can see we're, we're doing here species classification for birds across hundreds of species. And over the years, um, the performance is getting pretty good. Um, maybe you can guess from this chart when deep learning was first introduced to the topic. Um, and so we come to a position where general bird species recognition, okay, it's possible to deploy it as an app, it's possible to offer it to, to people uh, to use. But how many species are we actually considering, right? So on the oh, sorry, y axis here, I've got a logarithmic scale of number of species or categories. And this bird cleft challenge that I just referred to is about 600 species. And so that's here. It's, it's way more than uh, something like the audio set uh, data, data set for, for sound recognition. Um, and another quite well-known uh, case is BirdNet, which is a, a species classification algorithm, which it does cover um, a few thousand uh, bird species, which is really impressive. Shazam is up here at the top, fingerprinting, we're not gonna do that. Uh, but uh, what I have above here is actually the number of species that are uh, known in the category of birds, bats, or orthoptera, which is grasshoppers and crickets and so on. And so that's on the order of 10,000. And although we don't necessarily need a system to recognize 10,000 different species in any one location, that really is the scale of the challenge. If we want to develop it as a service to run across Europe, we need to, we need to go beyond um, the current state of the art and even the uh, bird net, which performs very well across both uh, America and Europe, it's not quite there. And it's not just the size, of course, it's the accuracy as well. So bird net has a pretty good area under the curve, uh, F score, yes, it's good, um, but of course it can be better. And we want balanced sensitivity across all these uh, thousands of classes as well, which, uh, which really raises the, um, uh, raises the bar for the performance. So I'm going to talk about uh, a few strategies that we are uh, exploring and uh, that take various parts of the process, at least the standard uh, process for audio species recognition and what we do to them. Um, we'll talk about embeddings uh, quite a lot. So the classic thing about embeddings, if we uh, Let's see, I don't have my definition on the screen there. Um, an embedding is a way of uh, representing, uh, well, it's, it's essentially any kind of feature representation, but the classic way to produce it in deep learning would be to take an audio uh, classifier, it's trained to take an audio file as input and produce a class label. And then we'll take off this final layer of the classifier There we go. We'll take off the final layer of the classifier. And um, um, what comes out of this penultimate layer is now some kind of vector representation. So this is coming out of 
um, the dense layer of uh, a CNN typically. And the, the vector feature representation that comes out of there is hopefully something that is generically useful. Finally, I've got my definition. Um, an embedding in my terms here is a representation that maps an input data item into a vector coordinate. And that vector coordinate should be useful for hopefully various tasks. And so the classic approach of uh, training a classifier is basically just the optimism that it embeds um, sufficiently semantically rich information that you can use it for related tasks. But nowadays, we typically don't just use a, a classifier with the head chopped off. We try to train an algorithm specifically to, to create good embeddings. And I want to show you an example from, um, again, not my research, but this is from Sethi et al. in 2020. Um, they showed quite a nice uh, result that from a generic embedding, and this is um, from 2020, this is a, like a sort of classic of what a generic embedding would be. It's an audio data set. Um, uh, audio set, using that to train uh, the VGG-ish uh, convolutional neural network, and then applying it to ecological data sets. And what they showed was that this generic embedding, which is really not optimized for ecological data at all, still it represents uh, aspects that are quite um, indicative of various things about both the habitat and the species that are in the habitat. What you see on this chart, so on the upper right hand side is habitat quality. And so they evaluate certain um, uh, locations and they find that various aspects of the soundscape when um, uh, processed with the embedding can give you good indications of the habitat quality. You also have um, relatively obviously throughout the seasons and throughout the time of day you have big differences in what the soundscape uh, consists of. And you can also actually predict directly from this kind of representation which species are present. So it's a kind of indirect way of inferring um, uh, the ecosystem characteristics. So is that good enough? I mean, it's, it's great if an off-the-shelf uh, representation can give us plenty of information. Um, Another uh, great example from the literature is this challenge, which uh, was conducted relatively recently, the HERE challenge. In this plot, which I won't go through in great detail, um, the, the white and yellow uh, cells are the cells where an embedding is performing well. And so they evaluated lots of different representations down this left hand side, and they evaluated them across lots of different tasks, which are the columns. So this includes a lot of music tasks, a lot of uh, speech tasks. And uh, I kind of like the fact that uh, on the left hand side, we have these uh, blue, blo blue blocks and black bo blocks. There seems to be a, a challenge, a task that's uh, not performing very well. And it happens to be the only bioacoustics task in the, uh, in the challenge, uh, beehive state recognition. And there are some specific reasons for this, but yeah, I kind of like it as an example that, um, even though um, even when a system performs well on what might be some of the classic speech and music tasks that are in the uh, acoustic signal processing field, that's absolutely not the case that that means they're going to generalize well to um, other tasks with other types of data. Hey, Dan. Yes. We, we have a question just real quick. Um, Go for from it. Treya, he, he wrote in the chat, he said, does the new data set have a long tail distribution? in terms of the number of examples per class? Can you maybe comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the, the the data that we are working with, when you have, um, if, if you're looking at either the species occurrence in um, uh, sort of nature monitoring uh, uh, projects, it's pretty common that you have something like a long tail distribution of the, uh, of the relative abundance of the species. So then you get a, a relatively straight line on the log log plot. And the same is also true for the data sets that we collect. So yes. Okay, thanks. Motre, Mo feel free to unmute if you want to follow up at all. Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's keep going. Yep, thanks. So with um, 
starting to zoom in, zoom in a little bit on bioacoustic analyses, uh, we've run our own uh, data challenges. And so one of the first ones we, we put together for bioacoustics was bird audio detection. And one of the things that we find is people tend to assume that it's the complex sounds that will be difficult to identify. So complex bird song, uh, there are certain species which have, you know, can sing for minutes and minutes and, uh, and have almost no repetition. But those sounds actually carry quite a lot of information that is that, that, that gives away their species. And um, in this challenge, we found especially that common errors were very short sounds. There are a lot of birds which will emit calls that are alarm calls or alert calls to say oh, something to worry about. And the sound is just something like. And when you look at that on a spectrogram, it's very similar, and we saw that in the data, it's very similar to the sound of a raindrop falling on a leaf or a microphone. Um, and so these short sounds, uh, surprisingly, are still quite a, a challenge. And I think I think this is something where we can improve the representations, the actual signal representations to, to, to create better discrimination. More recently, we run a few shot bioacoustics sound event detection challenge. I'm going to come back to this later in the talk. Um, but common errors here, this is probably quite predictable that if the sound is faint or distant, or if the sound is non-stereotypical, then it causes problems. So it's very common in natural sound that although a lot of species are quite stereotyped in the type of sounds they produce, there are always edge cases. Common edge cases include uh, when there's juvenile animals who haven't quite sort of um, settled on their adult sound yet, or it can be um, song or calls that get interrupted, lots of reasons to have non-stereotypical sounds. And so, yeah, we have, we have lots of difficulties with basically edge cases. So the question is, what shall we work on? I've already hinted a little bit that the input representation might be something interesting to work on. Um, I'm not going to talk about network architecture today. Um, we can uh, we can we can talk plenty about CNNs and transformers and other things, but uh, that's not my focus today. Um, I will also have a uh, take a bit of time to think about the training objective because uh, well, well we'll see a couple of examples of, of different approaches we can take, and of course we could just improve the training data. Right, this is a uh, uh, we don't need a complex method when a, when a simple method will do. Um, if we could simply get more fantastic training data, that would be great. It's very difficult because, of course, this, this is um, typically it's something that can't be annotated by something like crowdsourcing because the distinctions can be the kind of distinctions that either need quite a lot of pre precision or simply need uh, expert uh, knowledge. So on the topic of improving the, the data, um, I want to look at the dense dawn chorus. And so this example I gave you at the start of the talk, I'm just going to play this example again. because I've annotated uh, the answers here. And so have a listen to this uh, and see if you can uh, uh, pick out any of your favourites. All right, so this is a nice example. Um, there's, there's quite a lot in there, and it, it takes more than one playthrough to be able to annotate it in detail. So I, I hope this partly justifies my, my claim that it's not trivial to annotate this stuff. Um, and this is not the most difficult example. I think it's a particularly nice one. Um, when you have uh, the dawn chorus, when birds are singing at dawn, it can be as many as 30 species singing together. Um, and this is, you know, it's kind of an interesting biological phenomenon. Why do they all sing at once? If they spread themselves out over the day, maybe they could uh, be heard more clearly. And that's actually um, a nice topic of debate within uh, animal behavior, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Um, talk about the uh, acoustic recognition and said, prior work uh, has only studied uh, classification up to about three simultaneous species. Now that's not to say that a classifier couldn't un uh, simultaneously classify more than three species at once, but it really hasn't been um, systematically studied. And that's because the data sets simply aren't there. It's difficult to analyze these dense, uh, it's difficult to annotate and analyze these dense uh, dawn chorus recordings. 
So what we did recently was um, uh, an approach which is pretty common in uh, acoustic machine learning now, which is to use data augmentation to create these dense soundscapes with a controlled polyphony. And so in this case, we're going up to polyphony 10. Now that's not the most dense possible, but, uh, but it gives us a good handle on, on how the state of the art might be performing. In this chart, you can see that if we train a system on either three, six, or 10, as the si simulated uh, synthesized uh, polyphony of the data. Uh, I'll skip over this column here, but the final three columns, that tells you what happens when you test it on data that has up to three, up to six, up to 10 as the, as the polyphony. Of course, you might expect that a system performs well on conditions for which it has been trained. And so generally that is the case. We get this diagonal line where, okay, the best performance is approximately on this diagonal line. Um, when a system is trained on a polyphony as high as three, it actually doesn't seem to be the best system for, for application. And so, so maybe dense uh, soundscapes are better for training because it helps a system to learn how to disentangle uh, the factors of these multiple uh, sound types. And um, of course, you might want, you might say, well, we can if we match the uh, system to the conditions, then uh, then we're good. But of course, we really want to have just one system that we can deploy without knowing what the polyphony is. Um, and my personal conclusion from this is that the one that is trained on ten, trained on the densest soundscapes, we actually get pretty real, pretty consistent performance all across um, the density. This is good because, as I said, we want to have relatively consistent performance across different species and across different conditions. And so um, it's not merely a question of uh, which one which one is the highest number in this table, but which one gives us the most consistent performance. So this is a, a result we published last year in the DCASE uh, workshop and OK, training on 10. This is good. We can, of course, go further with more data, um, and that's that's ongoing work. So next, I want to turn to this idea of uh, the input representation, and I really want to motivate it with insect sounds. I um, I'm going to presume that uh, the, the audience here might be more familiar with bird song than with insect sounds because uh, we hear and we we pay attention to bird song quite a lot. But insect sound is uh, is particularly important. It's important because uh, insect biodiversity is particularly important. Uh, insects are key members of our ecosystems, pretty much every ecosystem. They are a uh, food source for the uh, larger animals. Um, they are pollinators. They provide other services that are really important to humans. Um, and so we really want to know what the uh, what is going on with insect biodiversity. And there's also been plenty of reports in the past uh, five years, especially that um, insect biodiversity is in trouble. But for insect sound recognition, there's been very little machine learning research on it. Um, I think, again, that is largely because of data availability issues. Um, but as a sound category, it's really interesting. I'm sure you know that many insects, such as this field cricket here, they produce sounds very differently from the way that humans or um, other vertebrates do. And uh, they do it perhaps by um, rubbing legs together or by clicking the sort of wing parts together. It depends on the exact species. But uh, I'll play this sound again. This is the field cricket. The, the production method uh, helps to motivate the idea that maybe the spectrograms I'm showing you might not be the best way to, to analyze the data. Um, you can see that the MEL spectrogram, okay, the, the actual frequency ranges in these filters doesn't really look ideally matched, but actually in the linear or the MEL spectrogram, we have quite a lot of energy spread across all these different bands. And, and this is much more spread than in, in many sort of tonal sounds. So I think it's a 
a great example of something we should use to help motivate new signal representations. I'm just going to talk about one representation now, which is certainly not the last word on the matter. Um, but we, we, we finally we have data sets with which we can perform species recognition on uh, insects such as crickets and grasshoppers. So we performed uh, a study to see if we can learn appropriate filters from the input waveform. We want to skip the fixed spectrogram step. Ideally, we want to learn some kind of representation that has you know, a great match to the characteristics. Uh, we started with looking at raw waveform uh, based methods. So this is simply uh, one dimensional CNNs applied to insect sounds. But <clears throat> in practice, we don't yet have the data sets that are large enough to, to drive that kind of system. Um, or maybe there is more work required in that. But a, a lovely alternative, which has appeared um, from Zegidor et al. Uh, in 2021, is this learnable front end um, whose block diagram I'm showing down here. So as compared to the MEL spectrogram, there is an analogy here. Instead of the Fourier transform, we are applying a, a GABOR uh, filter bank. Um, and then later on, we've got a, a low, low pass and a sort of normalization step. Each of these three blue boxes is a block with learnable parameters. So the uh, hope here is that for something like insect sound, of course, we can learn which are good frequencies and uh, bandwidths and other characteristics as well. Now, for a GABOR filter bank, we've just got essentially the uh, uh, frequencies and bandwidths. And so, OK, this is a good start. Let's see what we can do. So in this work from my MSc student, Mary Spice, we uh, looked at species classification with a convolutional neural network. And the comparisons being made are between a, a neural network, which is being driven by the MEL spectrogram as input, versus one driven by this leaf representation as input. And so the arrow here is to represent that in the leaf version, not only the convolutional neural network parameters are being learned, but also the parameters for the leaf uh, representation. Uh, the results are that we can get improved classification here. We've got uh, 32 different insect species. Um, the F score goes from 52 to 66. Fantastic. And these green boxes here, two green boxes, those show the species which are actually in the same uh, family. So we can see that most of the confusions are within the uh, the family of, of uh, insects, and so relatively uh, to be expected. Performance is pretty good overall. Um, and across 32 classes, we now have data sets that go up to 66 classes as well. And so this is starting to build towards those 10,000s of, uh, of species that I told you about at the start. And a particularly nice observation is, OK, this leaf representation was introduced by others and it's been used for other data sets. Um, in our uh, application, the filters do adjust themselves during training. Uh, if I focus on the lower row of diagrams here, OK, so we initialize the filters so that they match the MEL uh, filter bank, just to give some kind of initialization. And we find after training that um, in the box E here, you can see that the filter frequencies have actually moved around a lot. So each of these initialized filters has moved around quite a lot. Um, the final column just shows the same result here, but sorted by frequency. So you can see there is definitely a different distribution of frequency emphasis, but also a lot of movement. And that's actually much more movement than was observed when other people applied the leaf representation to speech or to music. So I think that's pretty good uh, representation. We are um, also introducing, uh, we, we published the data sets uh, that are going along with this, and I really hope that uh, others can, uh, can take this forward. I really want to think about the representation for this kind of, kind of sound. OK, so that's at the um, sort of at the front end of our classifier. Um, for the next examples, I want to think about how we train the classifier and what kind of optimization we're performing. A lot of these distinctions, and that actually, to be fair, I would say that includes the insect sound classification that um, I've just told you about. These classifications would often be treated as fine grained classifications because they are fine distinctions uh, being made often. 
But a really nice uh, fine grained example is can we recognize individual birds? So not just is this chiff chaff a chiff chaff, but is it the same chiff chaff that landed on the loudspeaker yesterday or is it a different individual? This is not just an idle question, it's really useful for population monitoring, for example. So if you want to count the number of individuals, it really helps to be able to distinguish between the individuals. But of course, it's a difficult task because usually we have very few examples per individual. So in um, animal sound, this would typically be approached by saying, OK, for this particular species, I'm going to take some features and I'm going to try and train a, a classifier for the for the individuals that I know about. And that's OK, but then you have to train a new classifier for every different species that you're interested in. Um, and also, you're kind of limited by this one species where you have not very many examples per individual. So instead, we want what we want to do is to try and generalize over all of these um, tasks. We've got lots of different individual classification tasks, and they form a hierarchy. So I've been talking quite a lot about birds, and here are the chiff chaffs. We have two different chiff chaffs here. Uh, we can consider a different species of bird and the individuals there. Now, the distinctions between individuals might not go along the same axes, uh, say feature axes, uh, for each species, but there are going to be commonalities somewhere in there, let's say. And for mammals, if we've got cat or wolf, okay, there are going to be similarities. And certainly, I think within the, the domain of mammals, there are, there are often uh, similarities, but perhaps differences as well. And so if we ensemble all of these together with a sort of multitask approach, we should be able to, to generalize over this and, and, and create a useful individual recognition. So these categories form a hierarchy. And one thing that's nice about um, an embedding uh, approach is that embeddings can indeed handle hierarchies, right? So I've, I've represented it here with um, clusters inside clusters. So it's perfectly plausible that if I was to train a system to recognize lots of different individuals, that those tiny clusters might form a hierarchy in the, in the uh, of clusters in the space. But really what we want to do is to encourage that directly because we have some prior belief that the space should be structured like this. So to create a generic space within which we can solve a mammal identification task or a bird identification task. Um, we're going to take a standard uh, machine learning approach to, to create an embedding, but then we want to actually uh, try and encourage the, the through the loss function that these the hierarchy of labels is going to be respected. So the key here is the, the, lo the loss function that we choose. Now, instead of choosing a um, standard classification loss function or um, a distance based loss function, such as a, a classic uh, triplet loss function, here we're essentially using distance on this tree that I have uh, indicated. Distance on this tree is the distance to be represented in the loss function. You can think of it taking one unit, two units to go up from a leaf to the top layer <clears throat> and then two to go back down, or if, we have, if we're if we looking within a species, it takes just one leap up to the species and then one leap down to the individual. So within our classes, which are still, of course, discrete uh, compact classes, we have a variety of different distances to be encouraged uh, between those clusters. And so we find that this, this does work. Um, again, this is, this is something that's uh, uh, ongoing work, and this is the work of Ines Nolasco, PhD student working on uh, uh, this topic in general. What I didn't uh, emphasize is that, okay, we, we're taking, uh, in, in our experiment um, uh, published at ICAS, we are using pretty much a standard embedding and then training just the linear layer. But of course, we can, we can fine tune, we can use, um, we can train the whole network this way, assuming we've got enough data. This is a recurring thing. And so to come back to this recurring thing, a question that I guess asked all the time is, um, can we detect a particular call of a particular species uh, in these many, many hours of noisy audio? 
and here are five examples that I've labeled. Um, this this really isn't a joke. You know, I'm, I'm a lot of what I'm uh, driven by in the kind of approaches that we're trying to use. Um, uh, we're trying to uh, get beyond the answer that you need a massive data set in order to uh, answer the question. And so um, uh, a, a quite a strong strand of work that we've been uh, pushing recently is to use the, uh, the approach of few shot learning instead of supervised classification and applying this to sound event detection. So you may have heard of few shot learning before. This is a, a recent thread in uh, machine learning where the idea, well, one of the ideas certainly is as meta learning. So instead of training a system for task X, let's train a, a system that will give general good performance across a kind of collection of related tasks. Now, if you compare this to the individual recognition that I talked about just before, Okay, that was also a collection of loosely related tasks, but in that case, we had a hierarchical structure of the tasks that we could rely on. So there's a sort of a dependency there on this ontology. Now, to be a little bit more flexible about it, we can use this. We can say few shot learning doesn't impose very strong constraints on how the tasks are related, only that they should generally come from a cluster of related tasks. And if we can meta learn, so we train a system uh, in the training phase, exposing it to many different uh, tasks as separate tasks. And then, uh, and then at test time, we can expose it to just a few examples of our new task and it should be able to answer the rest. Overwhelmingly, this few shot learning idea has been applied in classification. Um, and what we're doing particularly here is event detection. So the important difference is that we want to find the onset and offset uh, times for the events. That's what we've depi depicted in this image here. So if I have labeled where the onset and offset of our first five events are, what I want to know is what's the onset and offset for all the other events in the audio. When we first started this, we assumed that it uh, had already been uh, addressed in some other work, but actually um, setting this, setting few shot learning up for uh, for event detection uh, in, in this uh, in this way was uh, turned out to be it was a new thing we had to we had to set up. To give you an idea of what the data are for this, we uh, collected together a lot of different data from various collaborators because we really need to. Um, uh, represent a lot of different characteristics in bioacoustic uh, data sets. So yes, we had birds and mammals, we have dense sound scenes, and we have sparse sound scenes. Um, mostly we have um, terrestrial sound scenes, which means on land, uh, but we also have a handful of recordings, uh, sorry, so data sets which are based on underwater data. Now you can see from the training data list here and the validation data list here that we are not having the same classes in the training, the validation, the test. That's what makes it different from supervised learning. So we can train with bird and mammal data sets and yet in validation, we're gonna say, okay, how can you do on the flying insects? Uh, it's a really important distinction that, uh, uh, that, that is pretty much primarily the distinction that uh, makes it useful as a meta learning task. And the evaluation data, well, we are currently running the um, 2023 edition of the DK's uh, few shot sound event detection task. And so uh, we'll maybe uh, give you the results and uh, what the evaluation data are when we've finished, when we've finished that. So uh, watch this space and uh, watch it DK's. So methods uh, for few shot learning. When I first uh, encountered few shot learning, it seemed obvious to me that you might just, just use fine tuning. This is one of the classic uh, approaches in deep learning that is pretty straightforward. Okay, we're gonna train, we're gonna pre-train our network on whatever data you uh, have available at training time. And then at test time, okay, we've got five examples. So let's fine tune, let's train the system a bit more. In the literature, you'll find that it's generally not favoured, uh, at least partly because there's a strong risk of overfitting to these five examples. You need to find some way of controlling that that's not going to happen. 
And so specific methods that we use for few shot learning, um, prototypical networks, this is um, a standard uh, in few shot learning literature. But again, it's something that we had to adapt so that it could work for the um, sound event det detection uh, scenario. So this depends on a particular loss function. Again, it's not a classification loss function uh, exactly. It's it's more of a distance uh, loss function. And what this means is, OK, so at training time, we're exposed to these different tasks here. I've got a green, an orange, uh, and a gray task. We're not training to find good decision planes to separate these categories. Instead, what we want is that the five examples should form good uh, good clusters uh, to create good centroids in the embedding. And so we take the uh, for the uh, feature space locations of the five examples, we take the average across these, and that centroid is then the target for learning. So we now want uh, to train the system so that the distance from the examples to the centroid is small relative to the distance between the centroids. And then at test time, we introduce a new uh, example and okay, we can compare it against the previously known centroids or we can form new centroids simply in the manner of k-means. These results that I'm showing are of the baseline system. So our prototypical network, the F measure is okay. It's, it's doing okay. It's not fabulous, but it's okay. But in particular, it performs much better than the uh, standard methods that will be used in um, bioacoustic work, where we might use something like a spectrogram template matching. This is kind of really sort of standard uh, approach uh, for a lot of animal sound analysis. So this approach to prototypical networks, it does represent uh, an improvement, e even when it's just our baseline system. But the results of uh, DGAS 2022, I won't go through this in detail, but uh, the overall performance is, yes, we can get way beyond even our baseline system. OK, we're getting up to around 50 percent, 60 percent on the event based F score. And this is also um, an area where we look forward to more development in the future, because what we see in these results is that modified versions of the prototypical network approach um, lead to a lot of the best performance. And so that the, the, the the modifications involve especially how to select the negative prototype and the positive prototype in that feature space, how to deal with big differences in the durations of uh, bioacoustic sound events. But as you can see by the div diversity of colors in this, uh, in this chart, there is not one method that is generally leading to strongest results. Um, you can see that the classifier, people are using CNNs, and uh, there is, of course, some use of transformers and other methods, but the um, it's not the, the body of the neural network that, that is where the, uh, where the development uh, is really happening. It's in how you develop the loss function, um, in particular, how you develop the loss function in the case where we have bioacoustic event data, where we have onsets and offsets to predict. This was a big collaboration, and so I just quickly want to acknowledge the people who came together to specify the task and to contribute data sets. So, so thanks to all of those, uh, and uh, they are listed, of course, on the DCASE webpage. I'm coming to the conclusions now, but um, I've been through various methods, particularly to try and work towards high resolution embeddings for uh, large scale animal sound classification. As I, as I said at the start, we're working towards European scale, we're working towards continental scale and many thousands of categories. So we need to improve pretty much all of the steps in the pipeline. So the methods that I've talked about to encourage high resolution embeddings, we've talked about signal adaptive uh, input, hierarchy aware training and few shot learning in particular. So these are methods that we've investigated in various separate pieces of the um, pieces of the puzzle but clearly a lot of these things can and should come together in various ways um, I'm not ruling out of course and I've seen this from previous experience I'm not ruling out that a simple-minded approach will work fantastically as long as you have a very big data set and some some nicely uh, nicely derived spectrograms 
but I do think that we need to uh, we need to uh, evaluate further these approaches and put them together appropriately for animal sound. There's a kind of conceptual question, which is, can one embedding, one signal representation, represent every single one of these sound categories um, that we're interested in? The core would be, can we represent every animal species as, se as a separate cluster in some representation? In principle, it's possible. Um, but as I've said, there are many edge cases in every single one of these clusters, there are edge cases. So it's an open question whether whether the sort of one embedding to rule them all is indeed the best approach or whether we should consider dividing and conquering the task in, in various ways. Um, it's certainly nice to strive towards this approach where a single embedding uh, covers everything. Um, and in few shot learning, the general idea to develop, let's say, a prototypical network which learns an embedding great, that can create a single fixed embedding, which we've shown can be really useful. Um, but there has also been some uh, various things come along. So let me just show you, do we have it here? Okay, it's not highlighted on this uh, on, the, on this table, but using one embedding, but then maybe customizing it at test time uh, can, be the, can be the way to go, which means, which is really stretching the idea of a single representation for everything. So, of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, and I hope we can talk about that. I have a newsflash, which is that we have a new uh, project uh, launching in autumn, and I would really uh, love to hear about people who would like to study a PhD in these topics. So this is a Marie Curie, a Marie Sklodowska Curie doctoral network, and it's called Bioacoustic AI, starting early next year, and PhDs located in various uh, European countries. So if you'd like to study AI methods with animals and sound and signal processing, I would love to hear from you. And um, yeah, recruitment will begin officially. So this is just an early news flash. But yeah, please spread the word. Finally, I want to give credits to the people who did the work that I've talked about. So for dense birdsong detection, that was Alberto Perea, and for insect sound recognition, Marius Weiss. Now they were both doing uh, their master's projects uh, with me. Now the few shot sound event detection, this was a big collaboration. It was led initially by Veronica Morphy um, and now by Inesh Nalasco and Shubra Singh, who are both working with me. They are based at the Centre for Digital Music in London, but they're studying their PhDs with me, uh, as, along with the many collaborators uh, who came together for this. Uh, so with that, I'll thank you very, thank you very much for your time and uh, I'm very open to questions. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, that was great. I think Matt had a question, but it looks like he maybe dropped off. Um, so, so there was a question in the chat, so maybe I'll I'll, I'll read that. Um, I'll see if Matt. Go for it. Minds. So it says regarding input representations, do you take into account animal perception? Perhaps you know designing something like a Mel filter bank, but for each species, um, mm. maybe including you know infrasound or ultrasound and. Um, it also says, I believe that sounds that are very similar to humans might be very distinct for the animals producing the sound. Absolutely. Um, so firstly, uh, I'll refer back to kind of the history of sort of speech research and music uh, research as well. And um, I remember when I was doing my PhD, this, there was this frustration that this the Mel spectrogram or at the time MFCCs, okay, it seems like a not the optimal representation for the task you're trying to solve and yet somehow you can't outperform this basic representation and i think the same is true in animal sounds as well that um different animals have different frequency sensitivities uh certainly true and um and so a quite straightforward thing to do is to manually design the spectrogram based on their known frequency sensitivities and i'm aware of various people having tried that and the results are, well, maybe it helps a bit, but it certainly doesn't um, create a big leap. The other thing to bear in mind is that I'm talking about multi-species uh, recognition here. And so we can't just handle one single um, uh, species perceptual abilities. Um, we, we need to consider all of them, which basically means we need to consider a wide range of frequencies. 
I want to mention one very specific thing that we did do about this. Uh, it's not in these slides at all, but um, we have a preprint out um, by Zandberg et al, uh, where we took zebra finches in the lab, we play sounds to them, and we ask the zebra finches, are these two sounds similar or different? And then we're using the decisions of the zebra finches to try and drive a machine learning algorithm to learn an, an embedding. And um, it actually, it's it's a lot of work because in, in this case, we had zebra finches in the lab. It took maybe four months, six months of playing thousands of sound examples to the birds and recording their decisions and a lot of careful work by Lee Sundberg um, and others to actually encourage the birds to answer these questions. Um, but we did find that, yes, we can train an embedding based on these sort of perceptual judgments and that that uh, representation uh, outperforms other types of embedding for specific tasks such as birdsong similarity, um, individual recognition. So yeah, it's it's possible to do it and we've investigated it. It's a really big task and I think it would be great to find methods in future that can be somehow perceptually driven while also not needing seven months in the lab for each species you're uh, interested in. So, sorry, just one quick follow up for me on that. How does the zebra, how do you know whether the zebra finch decides they're the same or different? Okay, so this is set up as a kind of ABX distinction test. So we, we play sound A, sound B, and um, the birds have been trained to, okay, they're, they, uh, they're in this sort of large cage environment and when they want a, a treat, they, they play this game where we play them sound A, play them sound B, and they know that when they hear sound X, they need to decide whether it's an A or a B. Okay. Yeah, and this is, it's actually very similar to a lot of uh, the kind of discrimination tasks that we would set for human uh, listeners, except that we, of course, it takes a very different strategy to get the answers out of them. Um, but yeah, then we then what we do is uh, with those A, B, X uh, triplets, we're doing a triplet learning to recover the embedding. Okay. Um, hey, Ian. Great talk. Uh, just curious if you had looked into hyperbolic spaces for your hierarchical losses. We haven't looked into it. It's, it's an interesting example. So with uh, this hyperbolic spaces idea, so uh, you can create an, uh, most embeddings and uh, the ones that I've talked about today as well, actually, are typically based on either Euclidean distance functions or cosine um, similarity as, as a distance function. And um, with hyperbolic loss functions, you implicitly create this space uh, which, which naturally represents hierarchies nicely. And yeah, we've looked into it, but that we were, this is uh, within Inesh's uh, PhD project. We decided not to follow that one up, but it's uh, it's a line of inquiry that you know, we still have on the back burner. Cool, thanks. So, so let me ask a question, Dan. What about uh, source separation at all? Do you think that could like play a role in, in this at all? Have you, have you thought about it? If, if so, how? I have generally um, not followed the route of source separation, and that's um, that's partly an empirical uh, issue that you know with the, with the the level of um, uh, performance of source separation that I've seen, well, let's say <laughs> five years ago when I was uh, uh, developing approaches. Um, that you get quite a lot of artifacts, especially in these difficult to control outdoor situations. You get a lot of artifacts in uh, uh, in source separation that can then reduce the performance of recognition. I think that is still the case for these general wildlife sound scenes because they are so diverse and so uncontrolled, and and the um, the the background noise sources are also incredibly um, strongly variable. I think it's possible to get good results using source separation in these situations and um, 
there is a project uh, from uh, Google DeepMind which uh, published a uh, an investigation of um, animal sound classification based on their uh, source separation approach. Um, so yeah, it's it's a line of inquiry, and I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of sitting back and letting uh, letting them do the evaluation to see if it's ready yet, but. You know, it's, it's something that I, I can't necessarily rely on the quality of source separation to be sure that I should be using it. Yeah, makes sense. What, I'll, let me ask one other question. What uh, sample rate do you typically have to record these sounds at? Or Typically, we use uh, something like standard CD quality, so 44.1 kilohertz. Um, and the rate might then be reduced, uh, like halved or something, you know, in, in, in typical uh, deep learning approaches. Now, 44 kilohertz uh, is historically chosen because then it approximates to the human uh, listening range, which goes up to 20 kilohertz approximately. And that is also pretty much coincidentally that's pretty that's basically good for most bird song and, and most mammal sounds as well um okay. we would like to go beyond that and especially when you consider insect sounds um but also the very obvious case of bat sounds which are often ultrasonic that you want to go to higher rates and so uh, another thing that we are currently thinking about is how to handle multi-rate um data sets in our analyses. The majority of stuff that we get through the door is, um, you know, it comes from citizen science initiatives and so on. So it's, it's, it could be from smartphones or from uh, uh, consumer recording equipment or these sort of boxes that you leave in your garden. So most stuff that we get is at a kind of standard um, 44 or 48 uh, recording rate. Okay. There, any, anybody else have any questions? Um, Ricardo, just put one. Ricardo, do you want to unmute it? Or maybe he doesn't have a microphone. So let, let me ask on his behalf. Um, when you create the uh, artificial acoustic scenes to increase polyphony, do you take into account uh, domain knowledge? Like, for example, you only include species that live in the same area, or you don't mix nocturnal with diurnal animals, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, we don't. We don't. Um, this is, I think it's been seen in uh, other related scenarios that, for example, um, just uh, let's say urban uh, sound detection that, you know, there are certain types of sound that you will not or will um, expect to, to, to encounter at the same time. Um, but to include that kind of detail in the simulation that you, to create the training data, um, in principle, it could lead to better recognition, but of course, it also reduces the diversity in your simulated uh, training data. And uh, given that training, training data are limited, it's pretty much, I would say, not worth our um, effort to, uh, to set up those correlations. It, it's fine. As long as you're testing in re re realistic scenarios, then uh, we actually don't really need to go there. All right. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Yes, maybe I have one. Uh, what, is there any, uh, any work in um, like self-supervisor presentation learning for um, bioacoustic sounds? Yeah, self-supervised, this is kind of interesting and I, I uh, I, I wondered, you know, if I'm if I'm emphasizing the lack of annotated data, then uh, um, yeah, I would hope that someone uh, in the audience might be thinking, I wonder if we can do self-supervised. Um, I think it's interesting. One of the reasons that I uh, gave this example at the start of the talk with, uh, where are we? Oh dear, where's the sound panel there? Anyway, the example with uh, the loud noise uh, of construction over, overlaying mm -hmm. uh, the birdsong is to emphasize something that 
basically is something that I'm worried about in self-supervised learning, which is that um, if we take something like standard speech recognition or music uh, informatics, we can apply self-supervised learning because the signal of, on, of interest is energetically dominating the signals and the data sets. And in our case, it typically isn't. So unless you put quite a strong control on um, the uh, on what the self-supervised learning is, is going to learn, I'm actually just uh, kind of nervous that it goes away and learns about construction noise rather than learning about birdsong, right? So, um, I mean, I'd be interested to know if you think that that concern is justified, but uh, but that's one reason that I haven't particularly gone down that route. Although, of course, we can take self-supervised um, pre-trained systems and see if they uh, help us. Yeah, I guess I guess it could. I mean, if you were to um, to maybe you could you could use like very coarsely labeled data to try to avoid these kind of noisy regions, and then or use that to kind of start with self supervised learning on a better footing. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 that's a concern. Yeah, that makes sense. All of I mean, most of the self supervised learning methods now assume that you have a a data set of very clean. Um, I mean, like speech or music or some, something that you know you know it's it's the stuff that you're interested in, and and typically there's also um, like a, mostly one type of the stuff that you're interested in. Um, yeah. But yeah, here is also it. Uh, it's a, it will be very challenging, but, I, but but it sounds like it could be interesting at least to do to to get a better um, input representation. Um, so I, I expect that there will be some work on this in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Okay, thanks. So maybe I'll, I'll have one more question, just kind of a, a general direction, which is related to like arrays, you know, like kind of low localizing and all is is this all is everything single channel kind of that you typically get the data and use or yeah so um again uh, uh sort of uh, something that i didn't really emphasize but is if it is a big part of what steers me is what kind of data come through the door and um much of it is as i said uh, uh Sort of coming from smartphones or, or, or a, a little box that you might put in your garden and many of these are single channel uh, there is also a fair amount of stereo data and so that's uh, that's not just stereo from um, let's say stereo and recording from a smartphone but um also some of the devices that you can buy specifically for bioacoustic monitoring, they have two microphones, you know, and that's just a, a relatively standard setup. But again, there's a, there's a lot of diversity in the configuration. So there's not much we can assume about the microphone configuration. Um, there are controlled projects with very specific microphone arrays and of course we can do some nice things then uh, and and that's uh, that's not the focus of my research uh, at all but yes of course we we can do some great stuff with uh, with uh, fixed microphone array configurations i think there is still some scope to uh, take like stereo or small amounts of um, ad hoc microphone arrays and to have uh, flexible uh, well source separation based on multi-channel I, I think that can i think there's still plenty of scope to scope to develop that um yeah and so i think that that helps to get over one of my concerns with the source separation approach that you know content-based source separation um we need we need a slightly stronger steer than that i would say so yeah there is an okay amount of stereo and more data and that can and should be used but the vast majority of the data i encounter is mono yeah all right i have one one more question this i think is my last one this is like a current events related one but 
you know, I've been hearing a lot on the news, at least here in the U.S., you know, there's this bird flu and apparently it's really like impacting wild birds, you know, almost as much or more than like food source poultry. And I don't know, I mean, do you think bioacoustics has any role to play in like tracking a bird pandemic or is this something what you guys about at all? Um, wow, yeah. Um, okay, so that's the equivalent of the COVID cough detector then. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, it's not a question I've thought about. Um, let's see. I don't think there's going to be much acoustic trace of those kind of um, um, disease spread. I think it's pretty unlikely that uh, we'd be able to detect it in vocalizations. I think most often a sick individual would just vocalize less and so we just don't get the data um it's not my specialist field but i think that's pretty much all i can say about it yeah okay well, i mean i guess it would show up in like the counting and stuff right that you kind of talked about yeah absolutely and uh, one of the reasons that i'm excited about um developing uh automated bioacoustics is that these kind of approaches can give you results much faster than traditional approaches where you send some people out into the field to you know manually count things and so when we get to the state of being able to deploy these things and run them as real-time services <laughs> then the uh the kind of we'll have these real-time dashboards where yes we will be able to see the footprint of some of these diseases uh on on our population detections yeah yeah cool all right, another question just came through on the chat. Um, has anyone studied species that mimic sounds? And, um, you know, is there is there a role to play of these kind of um, species to distinguish between kind of like the real sound and mimicry? Bioacoustics. Yeah, now this is this is a sort of long term challenge. It's um, well, one issue is that it's actually quite difficult to uh, define that in, in a reasonable way to, to actually specify the task properly, because although there are some lab studies where you can control which sounds a bird is exposed to and then learns to mimic, most of these cases of mimicry are, are things that we kind of, well, I think I can hear that in the, in the, in the sound that the bird is making and um, it's anecdotal and it's sort of quite ad hoc. And if you don't know the sounds that it's imitating, then you obviously won't pick up on those imitations. Pretty difficult to ground truth, basically. Um, it would be really interesting to study because I know that uh, from the sounds that I hear, if we have something like parrots or mockingbirds or starlings that are imitating other sounds, you can pick up on it. And a lot of the songbirds do um take sound, songs that they've heard in their environment even if it's not the same species and perhaps absorb them into their own um, signature song so it does happen plenty and i guess this what this really needs is uh probably a big collaboration of people who study bird song and uh, this kind of imitation behavior to sort of get together and and really make a, a data set that represents that and I think that will make a really fun uh, uh, task to study, but um, I don't think we have uh, I don't think we have it specified yet.